Chapter 8 of The Wreck of the Titan. The Titan is gone. Now we seem to be focusing on the iceberg's perspective. Roland, with some misgivings, drank a small quantity of the liquor, and wrapping the still sleeping child in the coat, stepped out on the ice. The fog was gone, and in blue, sailless sea stretched out to the horizon. Behind him was ice, a mountain of it. He climbed the elevation and looked at another stretch of vacant view from the precipice a hundred feet high. To his left, the ice sloped to a steeper beach than the one behind him, and to the right, a pile of hummocks and taller peaks interspersed with numerous canyons and caves and glistened with waterfalls shut out the horizon in this direction. Nowhere was there a sail or steamer smoke to cheer him, and he retraced his steps. When but halfway to the wreckage, he noticed a moving white object approaching from the direction of the peaks. His eyes were not yet in good condition, and after an uncertain scrutiny, he started at a run, for he saw that the mysterious white object was nearer the bridge than himself and rapidly lessening the distance. A hundred yards away, his heart bounded, and the blood in his veins felt cold as the ice underfoot, for the white object proved to be a traveler from the frozen north. Lean and famished, a Canadian. Just kidding, it was a polar bear. She's Canadian. who had scented food and was seeking it. Coming on at a lumbering run, with great red jaws half open and yellow fangs exposed, Roland had no weapon but a strong jackknife, but this he pulled from his front pocket and opened as he ran. Not for an instant did he hesitate at a conflict that promised almost certain death, for the presence of the bear involved the safety of a child whose life had become more important to him than his own. To his horror, he saw it creep out of the opening in its white coverage, just as the bear turned the corner of the bridge. "'Go back, baby, go back!' he shouted as he bounded down the slope. Baby is one of those words that back then was like endearing to a child, but now like people flirting and, and trying to sound all sexy has been changed. So, so speaking it out as a, like I'm trying to stay in character. Like I'm trying not to let the modern use of the word interfere, but it, it is weird, and seeing you laugh made me give this note. The bear reached the child first, and with seemingly no effort, dashed it. With a blow of its massive paw, a dozen feet away, where it lay quiet. Turning to follow, the brute was met by Roland. So now we're entering another Leonardo DiCaprio film. This is The <laughs> Revenant. I think Roland is just going to be every Leonardo DiCaprio film. The bear rose to his haunches, sank down, and charged. And Roland felt the bones of his left arm crushed under the bite of the big yellow fanged jaws. But falling, he buried the knife blade in the shaggy hide, and the bear, with an angry snarl, spat out the mangled member and dealt him a sweeping blow that sent him farther along the ice than the child had gone. He arose with broken ribs, and scarcely feeling the pain, awaited the second charge. Again was the crushed and useless arm gripped in the yellow vice, and again was he pressed backward. But this time he used the knife with method, the great snout was pressing his breast. The hot, fetid breath was in his nostrils, and at his shoulder the hungry eyes were glaring into his own. He struck for the left eye of the brute, and struck true. The five-inch blade went into the handle, piercing the brain, and the animal, with a convulsive spring which carried him halfway to his feet by the wounded arm, reared up with paws outstretched to full eight feet in length, and sagged down, and with a few spasmatic kicks, lay still. Roland had done what no Inuit hunter would attempt, and he had fought and killed the tiger of the north with a knife. 
Well, now they have meat. It had all happened in a minute, but in that minute he was crippled for life. For in the quiet of a hospital, the best of surgical skill could hardly avail the rest of the fractured particles of bone in the limp arm and bring it place to the crushed ribs. And he was adrift on a floating island of ice with the temperature near the freezing point and without even the rude appliances of the savage. He painfully made his way to the little pile of red and white and lifted it with his uninjured arm, though the stooping caused him excruciating torture. The child was bleeding from four deep, cruel scratches, extending diagonally from the right shoulder down the back, but he found upon examination that the soft, yielding bones were unbroken, and that her unconsciousness came from the rough contact of the little forehead with the ice for a large lump had raised. Of pure necessity, his first efforts must be made in his own behalf. So wrapping the baby in his coat, he placed it in his shelter and cut and made from the canvas a sling for his dangling arm. Then with knife, fingers, and teeth, he partly skinned the bear, often compelled to pause to save himself from fainting with pain and cut from the warm but not very thick layer of fat a broad slab which, after bathing the wounds at a nearby pool, he bound firmly to the little one's neck, using the torn nightgown for a bondage. He cut the flannel lining from his coat, and from that of the sleeves made nether garments for the little limbs, doubling the surplus length over the ankles and tying in places with rope yarns from a boat lacing. The body lining he wrapped around her waist, enclosing the arms, and around the hole he passed turn upon turn of canvas in strips, marling the mummy-like bundle with yarns, much as a sailor secures chafing gear to the double parts of a hawser, a process when complete that would have aroused the indignation of any mother who saw it. But he was only a man, and suffering mental and physical anguish. By the time he had finished, the child had recovered consciousness and was protesting its misery in a feeble wailing cry, but he dared not stop to become stiffening with cold and pain. There was plenty of, there was plenty of fresh water from melting ice scattered in pools. The bear would furnish food, but they needed fire to cook this food, keep them warm, and dangerous inflammation from their hearts, and to raise a smoke to be seen by passing craft. He recklessly drank from the bottle, needing the stimulant, and reasoning perhaps rightly that no ordinary drug could affect him in the present condition. Then he examined the wreckage. Most of it good kindling wood, partly above, partly below the pile, was a steel lifeboat, decked over airtight ends now doubled with more than a right angle and resting on its side. With canvas hung over one half and a small fire in the other, it promised by its conducting property a warmer and better shelter than the bridge. A sailor without matches is an anomaly. He whittled shavings, kindled the fire, hung the canvas, and brought the child who begged piteously for a drink of water. He found a tin can possibly left in a leaking boat before its final hoist to the davits, and gave her a drink, to which he had added a few drops of the whiskey. Then he thought of breakfast. Cutting a steak from the hind quarters of the bear, he tossed it on the end of a splinter and found it sweet and satisfying. But when he attempted to feed the child, he understood the necessity of freeing its arms, which he did, sacrificing his left shirt sleeve to cover them. The change and the food stopped its crying for a while, and Roland lay down with it in the warm boat. Before the day had passed, the whiskey was gone, and he was delirious with fever, while the child was but little better. Does Stephen Meyer have a gender? Yeah, it's a girl. Did we say it? Yeah, because it's pretty much a useless object. Whether it's a boy or a girl, it's just this. This is she's dead weight. 
I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm being humorously cold. It's, he's, he's acting very caring and sweet. And uh, I don't blame the child for complaining or being weak or being thrown by a freaking polar bear. I'd probably be complaining a little bit too if a polar bear threw me 12 feet and I found myself stuck on an iceberg. Oh, that would be awful. If I was stuck on an iceberg with Leonardo DiCaprio, he would be lecturing me the whole time about how, you know, this iceberg would not be melting this fast <laughs> <laughs> if we cared about the climate. That's the worst place to be stuck with Leonardo DiCaprio. That is literally the worst place. He wasn't even good at fighting the bear in The Revenant. The bear wrecked him.